My name is Elise Gonzalez, and I'm the Assistant Director and Curator of Exhibitions here at the Art, Design, and Architecture Museum. And for those of you who don't know, it's the museum that's right next to the bookstore, so come on by. Thank you again for being here. Um, tonight's a particularly important event because it's a special conversation between two leading social practice artists. This talk came out of an exhibition that's currently on view at the museum called The Schoolhouse and the Bus, Engagement, Pedagogy, and Mobility. Two projects by Pablo Helguera and Suzanne Lacey with Pilar Riano Alcala. I'm happy to report that this exhibition is part of Pacific Standard Time LALA, which is an initiative that includes over 70 different exhibitions that examine the widespread and ambitious exploration of Latin America and Latino art in dialogue with Los Angeles. This exhibition is curated by myself and co-curator Sarah Reisman, who is the executive and artistic director of the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, which is focused on supporting art and social justice through grant making to organizations and exhibitions at the eighth floor. She will be moderating the conversation tonight. Before I turn it over to other introductions which need to be made, I wanna make sure and acknowledge the supporters, colleagues, and friends that have made this exhibition and program possible this evening. Marsha and John Mike Cohen were our leading sponsors for the exhibition and programs, and we thank them for their generosity. The Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Eva and Yoel Haller, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, the Western Humanities Alliance, the Department of Art, and the Santa Barbara Center for Art, Science, and Technology. These supporters are not only invested in the arts and the power of the arts, but they are truly good friends and supporters to us, and we are happy to count them among our museum family. So thanks to them for making this possible. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Robert Huerta, who is a current MFA student here at UCSB, who will introduce Pablo. Hello. Hi, hi, no? Hello? Okay, we run with it, right? All right, hi everyone. Uh, some of you may know me, uh, those of you that don't, my name is Robert Huerta. I'm a current graduate student in the, fine art, depart in the art department. Uh, we do fine things. Uh, uh, besides that, um, so I'll be introducing Pablo and my colleague will be introducing Suzanne Lacey, Pablo Helguera, that's their last name. Um, but just something quick about Suzanne. Uh, for every LA artist, or should I say, for every West Coast artist that I know, whose art practice is centered on people, the places they live, and the stories of their lives in these places, Suzanne Lacey is one of our biggest heroes. So having her here is just a really great thing, and I wanted to say that too. Um, and both my mentors, Devin Suno and Kim Yasuda, who can't be here today, would agree to that. Um, now, I don't know Pablo at all, okay? <laughs> but I've known about Pablo for a very long time. And it was actually Kim Yasuda, the person that I came here to study with that brought me here, who gave me this book, which is Art Scenes by Pablo. If you can see it, it's in a very shitty condition. Um, it's, it's, it's been through something. I'm, I apologize for the cursing, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and... Uh, and uh, in this book, Pablo outlines the beginnings of a sociology of contemporary art. Now, if that just kind of doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine. But uh, it's a pretty big gesture. He's like opening up a whole new field. And when I was doing research as a McNair scholar at Cal State Dominguez Hills um, in the art department, uh, it was Pablo's work that really gave language to something that I was trying to figure out. And, um, but specifically his writings. And so that's where I first encountered uh, Pablo's, um, let me get the title right, because I'm horrible with titles, I'm sorry, Pablo. Uh, the, uh, the Education for Socially Engaged Art, I just call it the manual for, so whatever, it's a manual. Uh, it's described by Pablo as the first, or on Pablo's website, sorry, as the first materials and techniques book for the emerging field of social practice social practice being that term that I was trying to figure out. Um, so now that I'm introducing him, and I'll be quick, I promise, uh, I have to sort of address where Pablo lies in my art family tree, and I like to think that he's my art uncle's famous friend that I've heard a lot about but never talked to. Um, 
And so that's really my way of saying that I look up to Pablo and that uh, his writings were just really important for me, and they still are. Um, so not only do I look up to him, but I owe him a lot, just as an artist, wannabe scholar, wannabe activist, uh, <laughs> or aspiring, emerging. Uh, and so uh, he's currently the director of adult and academic programs at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and that's a big deal. <laughs> For any artist, like that position holds so much weight that you could do a lot. Um, and uh, he's you know, received grants and awards from prestigious institutions, including the Guggenheim, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Creative Capital twice. Um, and so, uh, before he comes up to speak, Mesa Hickson, the one and only, my colleague, is gonna introduce Suzanne. So, please give a round of applause for Mesa Hickson. How you doing, Santa Barbara? All right, I'm really excited to be here today to introduce Suzanne Lacey, who is one of my personal heroines. Um, I grew up reading about her in a book on women in art that my grandmother gave me when I was really young, and I saw the kind of work she did with Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro and all of these incredible feminist artists who were so meaningful to my development as an artist and curator and socially engaged artist. So, um, it's delightful to be able to, to have this opportunity. And I also wanted to mention that um, Pablo Hilguera is another artist whose work has been extremely meaningful to me as I've developed as a curator and artist as well. Um, his manual for socially engaged art, which uh, Robert mentioned, was instrumental in informing a lot of the curatorial work I've done. I've had the pleasure of working with Pablo on the East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic area at the Delaware Center for the Contemporary Arts where he did a very interesting symposium on art that didn't take, an, a, in the, didn't take the form of an object. And um, it was called a Byzantine discussion. And it was a very playful kind of non-traditional symposium in which he came in and disrupted a panel discussion dressed in a Warhol wig and a ball cap and some um, aviator sunglasses, if I recall correctly. And most people didn't realize what was actually happening, but it was a very interesting um, discussion um, related to the idea of the, the role of the art object in contemporary art and what it means to make socially engaged art. And in fact, he was making socially engaged art in the form of a symposium. And so his work is subversive and very interesting, and I encourage you to look him up. Um, with regard to Suzanne Lacey, I was just thinking about how, as I performed um, my feminist wedding intervention today, how many of you were there for that? Yes, we, we married the whole class in a kind of um, uh, deconstruction of a traditional wedding. I found some quote of yours, Suzanne, that mentioned um, a work of art you made that, uh, of a bride at one point that resembled some type of cadaver. And at one point you said you knew that you would never get married. And um, that stuck with me as I was thinking back on my performance today. Um, so without further ado, Suzanne Lacey is a visual artist whose prolific career includes performances, video, and photographic installation, critical writing, and public practices and communities. She's best known as one of the Los Angeles performance artists who became active in the 70s and shaped an, an, an emergent art of social engagement. Her work ranges from intimate graphic body explorations to large-scale public performances involving literally hundreds of performers and thousands of audience members. Her work has been reviewed in the Village Voice, Art Forum, LA Times, the New York Times, Art in America, and in numerous books and periodicals. She lectures wild, widely, has published over 70 texts of critical commentary, and has exhibited in the Tanks at Tate Modern, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Whitney Museum, the New Museum, and PS1 in New York, and the Bilbao Museum in Spain. Her scores of fellowships include the Guggenheim Foundation, the Henry Moore Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Her book, Mapping the Terrain, New Genre Public Art, now in its third printing and available in both English and Chinese languages, was responsible for coining the term and articulating the practice. Leaving Art, Performances, Politics, and Publics, the Collected Essays of Suzanne Lacey, was published in 2010 by Duke University Press. A monograph, Suzanne Lacey, Space Between by Sharon Irish, was published in 2010 by University of Minnesota Press. 
Lacey was founding chair of the MFA in public practice at the Otis College of Art and Design. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy from Gray's School of Art at Robert Gordon University in Scotland. She currently teaches at the University of Southern California Roski School of Art and Design. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Lacey and Pablo Helguera. It's time to turn on our mics. Unmute them. Sarah, you can sit in the middle. Huh? Yeah. So, where would you like to sit? You in the middle. Okay. I'm in the middle. Social practice artists know where people should sit. <laughs> it's like the table, the dinner, the dinner setting. Um, so I'm going to start and just say a few words about. Is this echoing somewhat? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say a few words about how Elise Gonzalez and I came to organizing this exhibition. And in a way, it's kind of brief. But we were thinking about social practice. And we were thinking it should be two artists. Why? Because two artists, two people, two artists, two anything, creates a possibility for dialogue, which is integral to social practice. Um, and so one of the students who introduced, I think he introduced Pablo, um, mentioned what is social practice, but I don't think he defined it. So this is cursory research at best. Um, according to Wikipedia, social practice is an art. Listen, listen. Social practice is an art medium that focuses on engagement through human interaction and social discourse. Since it is people and their relationships that form the medium of such works, rather than a particular process of production, social engagement is not only a part of a work's organization, execution, or continuation but also an aesthetic in itself of interaction and development. Socially engaged art aims to create social and or political change through collaboration with individuals, communities, and institutions in the creation of participatory art. The discipline values the process of a work over any finished product or object. So, so did you write that, Pablo? <laughs> well, it's interesting you asked that because I um, looked at the sources, you know, when you're on a good Wikipedia page, it has a lot of footnotes. And the first two footnotes were Pablo Helguera <laughs> from his Manual for Socially Engaged Art, and Tom Finkelpearl, who's the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs in New York City, who's done a lot of writing and advocacy around social practice. So I thought that was interesting that you, you are the source. But then you're the source in a way that um, is kind of, beyond, I, I, I guess I want to start the conversation by posing the I'm the pre-source. Yes, you're the pre-source. And that's, that's a As good As opposed to resource. Resource. <laughs> resource. <laughs> But the reason I say that you're, well, we'll say you're the pre-source is that there was a time not that long ago when socially engaged art or social practice were not in use, right? So I want to just pose the question to each of you, do you consider yourselves socially engaged artists? Are you working with social practice? Do you want to start, Suzanne, as yeah, the pre-source? Um, I think there's some echo going on with, with the mics. Are you guys it's hearing it? a little it? distracting. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm feeling it. But. Yeah, all of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, First off, I want to say USC is in the house. Where are you? And Otis back there, social practice, is in the house. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming from Los Angeles. I, um, I, I'm not too concerned with terminology. I think terminology helps us move from one step to the next. I think it, it allows us to explore different aspects of a practice, you know, I talked about new genre public art years ago, and I was never really hooked to that as anything right. special. It simply talked about the way public art and new genre art could become mixed in uh, a practice. So I think what words do, and yes, I consider myself a social practice artist and a socially engaged artist, and even a conceptual artist, mm -hmm. although some people don't agree with me on that. Um, but I, I think that for me, terminology is simply a way to explore territory, which right. to me is what's fundamental to this kind of practice, is that we're sort of experimenting within these territories of the public and the making. Yeah, I agree with Suzanne. And uh, I would say and add that uh, perhaps the same problem applies to the definition of art in general. When you see somebody who is not very familiar with art, the, main, the first question they ask is like, but is it art? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and, what, and whether there's an answer to that question, what well, they think there's an answer to that question, and if the answer is no, then of course it's worthless. 
But as we think all know, as those of us who work in the art field, it's really much less about what it, it's called than what it does. You know, and it doesn't really matter how you call it anytime at this moment because it probably will be called differently 10, 20, 50 years right. from now. And, and I think uh, this becomes almost like a red herring for many artists. You know, how do you define yourself? How do you describe your practice in an elevator pitch? That doesn't really matter. What really <laughs> matters is really what is it, what, what are the set of concerns that inform what you do and how those concerns turn into an activity, action, uh, artwork, uh, gesture that it becomes meaningful. And I think that's what this type of things that we are doing right now that we have a hard time defining because of the proximity of time will eventually become called whatever. But, but what really concerns us as artists is how what we do becomes relevant. Right. I think they're valuable in, in that, remember when Nicholas Borio uh, got that great title, Relational Aesthetics, and we were all so excited about the title and so disillusioned about what was in it? Why, uh, why were you disillusioned? Uh, well, because he, he basically chose nine people, almost all but one men, man, and yes. he sort of framed, uh, I mean, I think it's interesting, the practice that emerged in galleries around relationality, but I, I think that what people got excited right. about was, oh boy, this is a way of defining real interactions that take place in the world. Right. And, um, it, and in fact, it wasn't. So boy, what I would give to have that title, wouldn't you like that one? Yes, exactly. Yes. I, I do remember when, um, when the, the relational aesthetics became uh, in vogue and all these artists were becoming, um, I guess, written about and having exhibitions. I, I was an educator at the Guggenheim Museum and, uh, and I was working on shows for these artists. And that's when I realized that this entire term and like this way of defining what these guys did was really not relational at all. Or, or was relational in a very limited capacity, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What I meant was that the, the kind of participation that went on in certain uh, exhibitions or uh, pieces that these artists were making was not really um, deeply engaging with an audience. And that, that was really one of the first moments where I really felt that uh, I wanted to make work that truly was about uh, interpersonal and uh, relationships mm. and uh, conversations with, with individuals well, and not simply like a nominal participation. Well, what was interesting was that when he did that and then we read the book, that really started a discourse in the field about what, what was relational right. aesthetics. And that's why I think these, these words become helpful building blocks. One of the things going on now is, uh, I think, is that social practice gets confused with everything else from architecture to you know, social or political science. So I think it's interesting the way it's used and you know, is allowing us to think through what is the relationship between an art practice that is social right. and an architectural practice that is social. Mm. Or graphic design. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard graphic designers say, graphic design is a social practice because you have to engage with people to come up with the design. Um, I guess just to take it in the direction of the exhibition that's on view at the Art Design and Architecture Museum, when we, put, when we settled on the two of you as the two artists for this exhibition, I mean, the exhibition has really emerged in response to works that we thought overlapped. So there's, it's the schoolhouse and the bus, mobility, pedagogy, and engagement. The schoolhouse is um, the School of Pan American Unrest. It's the space in which the activities of that project have largely taken place, or it's kind of a prompt, right, for the, the programming that you did throughout the Americas. And then the bus refers to skin of, skin of memory, right? And these two projects, we, we were, Elise and I were interested in how these two projects um, are conceptually linked, but they're also geographically linked. There's kind of a point of intersection in Medellin, Colombia. Not literally, it's not like you met on the road <laughs> together, um, but I wanted to just connect that this was our thinking, and maybe it was, um, there are many other intersections we could have made, I think, but something happened once we settled on the schoolhouse and the bus. Um, but prior to this exhibition, you, haven't, you hadn't shown together before, from what I understand. Sure. Um, and there's a, a moment that you work together at the College Art Association, um, and it's something that's been referred to, it's kind of a legend in the curatorial process, because <laughs> because we've seen bits of it, but we don't have. I just wondered if you could talk about how you knew of each other's work and what it, what it means to show together. Well, let me tell a little bit of a corny anecdote. Great. Sorry, Susanna. <laughs> I hate corny. Your work. But, 
but when I was uh, an art student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, I had just arrived from Mexico, and, and I thought I was a painter, and, uh, and I was going to be making paintings. I'm going to be a muralist, you know, <laughs> of course, right? And I moved to Paris, but you know, I couldn't afford to go to Paris, so I went to Chicago. Um, and, um, and then I had to take a performance art class, and I hated performance art. I thought it was ridiculous, it didn't make any sense to me. Who was that with? Um, it was with a professor who was a young performance uh, artist at the time. Mm -hmm. Her name was Patricia Pelletier. Mm -hmm. um, but what, so she, what the, the one thing that she did do is that she started showing us videos of different artists. This is 1989. And at some point, she showed a video of an artist named Suzanne Basie. And, uh, and it was uh, a work made in 83, 84, Whisper the Wind uh, Waves. The Waves, waves the Wind, yeah. Mm -hmm. wind, yeah. Uh, it was a, a, a video of a, of, a, of a performance, a project that Suzanne had done uh, with another artist and uh, in, in collaboration, right? And um, in the beach of in the beach of California, inviting women that were 65 and older uh, to sit at the beach and then speak about their experiences. And um, that piece was really important to me because I was coming from another country that valued uh, history differently. And, uh, and I was going through perhaps a difficult period of trying to make sense of American uh, culture and the way that it saw its own history. And I always felt that it did not value it properly, that there was a sense of, that uh, this was a, a society always looking to the future, but not very good at looking at the past. And I was coming from a, from a country that always looks at the past and is not very good at looking at the future. You know? <laughs> But that piece like, influenced me uh, or impacted me deeply. And, um, and then I did not think about doing performance for a long time until later. But, uh, but that uh, piece always stayed in my mind mm -hmm. from the beginning. So I mean, for, it's, for me, it's, of course, it's a big honor. And it's, uh, yeah. it's a really wonderful way. And when I actually met Suzanne, um, if I recall, I think it was in 2008, when we were at a conference together. It was perhaps the first time we... Was it the Serpentine? Oh, the Serpentine Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, if you have never met Suzanne, you, you will immediately, when, when you meet her, you'll see how accessible she is and how it's, it's easy to talk to. And, and in my job, uh, when I, in museums, uh, I work with a lot of artists who come to lecture at the museum, and I can tell you that's not usually what happens right. with, with an artist who's <laughs> of yeah. that stature. And, uh, and, and uh, that, that I appreciated it and, um, very much. And, uh, and it also signaled to me like that there's, there's a trait of uh, artists who work in the realm of social practice. You have mm. to be open to other people. You, it, it's no longer the type of practice that is about locking yourself in a studio and, uh, and just being by, with yourself mm -hmm. uh, making these masterpieces right. and, uh, and in this very private environment. What we do is very public. And even though we, we have an introspective moment, we are working with others all the time. And uh, it's crucial for us to have the type of uh, openness. Mm -hmm. I think speaking of relational aesthetics, I, I do think that that might be, you just might put your finger on one of the aspects of this practice, which I think is deeply reflective and deeply personal, but you, you operate within a kind of a public or a relational space around that subjectivity that meets with another subjectivity. And so I think in a sense, if you think about the studio as a, a, a metaphor for reflection, and then the difference being we're not reflecting with materials, but the kind of engagement processes and conversation processes. I always, I used to do a class with my students where we did, uh, this is way back in the women's building days, where we were first learning what performance art was. You know, I mean, we were kind of making it up as we went along. And I, I did a project called Self and Other, or an assignment. And so the first thing people had to do was think about something they cared about really deeply and do a performance around that issue. And then um, a week later, they would have to come back and think about what was a social phenomenon or experience that matched in some way or reflected that personal thing that, that they brought up in the first performance. And then they had to do, and at that time, people were doing character performances, so that was. Right, it sounds you know, like acting class or it, something. It was yeah. almost, yeah. but um, I, I wouldn't call it acting. We were never 
Yeah. Yeah. Or something thing. related to theater. But the third yeah. thing, but the third thing was then they had to go out and they had to actually find someone who was identifiable with that experience mm -hmm. and do a project with or about that. So if I felt um, like when I was a kid, I used to collect. Uh, things from the alley mm -hmm. all the time. I was really into scavenging from trash cans. And I began to think about that as something having to do with homelessness. And then that led me to do the bag lady, which was to go out and try to connect with homeless people. So that sort of movement between the self and the other and the constant reflection about what that means to share or to empathize with an experience seemed to me, seems to me fundamental to this process. Mm -hmm. Speaking of acting, I also want to point out that um, also when I was in my student years in Chicago, um, I, when, I, when I graduated, uh, it was really difficult to, uh, to exhibit your work anywhere in, in Chicago. It was, it, was, it was like a recession in the early 90s. And, uh, but Chicago has an amazing theater community. And uh, sooner or later, I landed in a, in a little community theater and started making theater you know, and performance. Uh, and uh, had you had an experience? I did, I, I did not have any theater experience, really. I was, I, I was coming from performance. And then I started dealing with actors. And, uh, and something that I really loved about the theater acting process was the interdependence that, that exists mm -hmm. in a play. You know, because when you do a play, you completely depend on your, t your team to right. really work. If somebody doesn't remember the line, then the whole play is ruined, right? And, uh, and I, I really loved the, the emotional connections that would take place in a process like this. And what it showed me was that it was completely different uh, to the studio experience that I was describing, where like it was so like self-centered and so much about like you competing against the others. This was really about doing something together and about learning how to negotiate and, uh, and uh, learn from one yeah. another. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel that's always been something that, at least in, in personally, has been of, of great interest to me. And I think that that also plays a role when you are doing a social practice project, which is, in a way, perhaps um, working on a social script that is unfolding and that you're writing collectively. Hmm. So to answer your question. Yeah, which one? Um, I, the one about. Um, uh, when I first heard of Pablo's work, I yeah. think I was in Creative Capital Network as well. And then I saw this um, grant project, this young guy that was going to drive all the way from Alaska to the, the tip of South America. And I thought, that's a really interesting project, because I'm into cars and driving and things. <laughs> and, and also, you know, the heroicism of putting yourself in that position and the challenge of going from the tip of one continent to another was very attractive to me to sort of think about that. And I thought, that guy's really into doing a very interesting conceptual work. It was something coming from the 70s and all the ways we shot ourselves and immersed ourselves in blood and everything. I was really interested in this kind of <laughs> guy that was immersing himself so deeply in an experience. And then you added the, you know, the complexity of the engagement with multiple people along the way. So I thought it was, conceptually, I was very drawn to the project even before I knew you. So that's a good lead into the context for the two projects that are on view at the ADNA Museum. Um, just to give you an overview of, can people read that? It's like a map of the Americas, and then it's also a map, a kind of a bump out map of Medellin. Um, so this gives a sense of the ge geographic scale of the two projects combined. Um, and I'll... So we'll start with Suzanne. You have um, Skin of Memory came out of um, certain conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And you were approached about the project. Can you talk a little bit about what you were asked to respond to, who reached out to you, how? I, I, was, I was working on um, a set of projects in Oakland that led me down a real deep path of learning about the relationship between class, race, and age, and particularly in California, and how policies were being shaped as a result of so social circumstances that young people were going through. And, during that time, I met uh, Pilar Riano um, in, um, I think it was in Vancouver. I invited her to do a, race, a racism, anti-racism workshop with a group of 30 young women I was working with up there. 
And she immediately saw the relationship between what was happening during the 90s in Medellin and in, in Colombia at large and what was going on in Oakland. Not just the violence per se, but the way in which young people operated both as, um, as sort of imaginaries for the public to produce a lot of policies as well as, you know, we're becoming, we're being victimized by social circumstances and by those policies. So in particular in Medellin, it was around the issue of class. And um, the difference, the similarities were the drug culture in California and in Colombia, and probably ultimately there was some connection with, um, you know, with the, with the politics of um, American intervention in communities of color and American intervention in South America, but that's something that is probably more than it's worth going into at this moment. But so what, what she did is invited me to come to Columbia and work with her and follow along with and amplify the social, the anthropological research she was doing on the relationship between memory and violence in that country with this kind of intersection of the way in which youth operated within that environment. And so I was invited into a circle of activists and um, uh, historians and social practitioners of various kinds who were trying very hard and ultimately became part of the network of academics who created um, a social, who, who were working on creating a new environment in Colombia. And that has resulted over time, not just those people, but those people are some of the leaders from Medellin in a kind of a, a national movement in Colombia that's resulted in the peace process now, that's underway now. And is it typical that you would be invited in as a, a an artist? I mean, has that happened in many other instances? Yeah, okay. often um, yeah. I join forces with political actors um, and I'm usually invited around an issue. Okay. But if I'm living in a town, like in Oakland, I might choose my own issues, okay. right? So at any rate, that's yeah. how it happened. She invited me to come work with these people and this is the kind of social environment we were operating within. We created the project as an expression for these academics and, 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 and uh, people who are variously active for social change, we created this museum of memories that would reflect the memories of people in this small community as it related to their, ex, their sort of both personal exploration of violence and the way um, their collective exploration of how memory was intertwined with violence. We can get into that later yeah. if we want. Yeah. Um, so there's some images just of you and Pilar plotting with a map, um, just showing the planning that goes into this. Mm -hmm. um, so this gives images of the museum that Suzanne's talking about. So then the School of Pan American Unrest um, you were responding to other, a different set of conditions, right? And there's some video here if we want to play. <laughs> I, mean, I can go um, up and play it, but maybe you want to talk first. Uh, let me talk first yeah. for a minute. Yeah. Um, so the, the seed, I guess, of the, of the project really comes after 9-11. Uh, after 9-11 happened, and I was in New York when, that day, um, many of us felt completely paralyzed. And particularly, I felt that art making was useless at this moment. It was that it was that it was really impossible to even think about making any art in a moment like this. And um, and that went on for a little while. And then I became very interested uh, in exploring, especially as uh, uh, the Bush doctrine started like a rattling and, 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 and grow, growing towards the invasion of Iraq, um, I became very interested in exploring the history of, of uh, US foreign policy. And I, uh, as, as, as a Mexican, of course, uh, I immediately turned to how that history uh, initiated in the 19th century with the Monroe Doctrine and especially the, 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 the idea of manifest destiny 
that, that was an important fuel to, to the U.S.-Mexico war. And, and this idea of, the, of, of this desire of, of, uh, of U.S. expansionism into the West. Um, and um, I, was, uh, I was also, as, as an immigrant, uh, very much aware of the way in which other Latin Americans, people from other parts of Latin America, bonded with one another, with how we bonded through cultural um, relationships and connections, and um, and how um, that how difficult it is to to see that in Latin America itself. It happens when we all are foreigners and we are in a, in a third place, but not so much when you are in our respective countries. Mexico rarely looks south. And, and the South looks more to Europe, like Argentina looks to, to more to, to France and, and Spain than it would look to Mexico. Um, at the same time, during that time, uh, the European Union was a very important, uh, was becoming a very important, po uh, powerful uh, conglomerate, of, of financial conglomerate that, uh, that was sending a model that I myself was uh, wondering, like why in Latin America we don't have something similar, you know? And, um, so we, I came to, to, the, to the conclusion that it would be really interesting to have a series of conversations uh, through the Americas uh, asking about what is Pan-Americanism? How does North and South America interrelate culturally? You know, if we were countries that were born around the same time, and like basically formed, uh, our modernities were born in the, in, around the same time, or political processes, how is it that we were so divided? And uh, initially I wanted to do this um, by traveling to different cities, uh, but in, immediately it just felt uh, impossible to do. Like I, I would, it would just be costly and it not be really that interesting. And one day I was writing a grant to Creative Capital, <laughs> and then I had this crazy idea, well, I'm just gonna say I'm gonna drive. <laughs> <laughs> it was just when you were doing the application that it Yeah, I got you. excited with, uh, with the application <laughs> process, and, um, and, um, and you know, when you write, write these grants, you know, you, you you, you have you, to be creative. You, you, you promise, you promise <laughs> the world, you know. And to my surprise, I got the grant. <laughs> so I had to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it was actually a really uh, interesting process, but, but, but the, the reality is um, I, I became much more uh, enamored with the idea that driving through the entirety of the Pan American Highway was an important symbolic gesture that also was, uh, in my view, um, consistent with the enormity of the Americas. And, and I, I also wanted to connect with the history of the various travelers uh, from, from the mission, missionaries to, uh, to Humboldt, to, to the beat poets, to so many different people who have traveled through the Americas and that kind of trace a little bit of those patterns uh, in, in the journey. These, these videos that are here um, were part of the initial research of the project. You can, can you play the video or no? I probably have to get up and press play, <clears throat> which is okay. Um, well, as I researched the, the, the history of Pan-Americanism, um, I, I landed into a number of videos that were produced by an office uh, created after World War II in the United States. It is the journey to banana land. Yeah, this is the journey. This is a very <laughs> racist video about, about Latin America. You know? Should I play it? Sure, you can okay. play it, yeah. Well, you can play just the first one. I'm going to speak over this uh, video so that you can get a context. Many of the, of the films produced uh, in the United States about Latin America um, had the political purpose to sensitize um, American audiences towards the, the, the identities of the countries that were uh, to the south. It was a political um, uh, um, need because the U.S. needed to, uh, to create bonds between um, the U.S. and the rest of the countries, and the, it, it, it had to do with the Cold War. Well, eventually became the Cold War policy um, of the good, good neighbor policy, um, and there was an office uh, uh, created around that time called the, the Office of Inter-American Affairs that produced a number of educational videos that uh, that tried to to talk about or show American audiences how people in Peru were normal people. They were not just like sitting in donkeys, but they, were, they had houses, they had families. You know, they, they were like, you know, they were having dinner in, at, at the table. They, they did not live in huts or, or it, it, was, it was really, as, as insensitive as it was, it, it does display a, an awareness and kind of a curiosity that in a way it's very naive, right. but that is the initiation of the understanding of the other 
from the American perspective. And uh, that was, to me, the, the beginning of the, the, the research project of, of Pan-Americanism. So these are various videos that connect to that. So maybe we can go forward to um, just Yeah, so to the in 2003, um, a curator in Switzerland, um, this was a few months before the invasion of Iraq, but we all knew that this was going to happen. Um, this curator in, uh, in Zurich, uh, in a place called Shet Halle, was curating a show about war and peace. And she approached me to ask me, like, well, is there something you would like to do for this exhibition? And I told her precisely what I was thinking about. And um, uh, because I am an educator and, and a museum educator, I really felt that the best platform for this type of discussion would be a school. Not a school in the sense that, in which I, I, I'm like this, the teacher that is teaching others, but it was a collective learning exercise. And um, I was very interested in, in creating a, a schoolhouse that, that, that had the, the qualities of the, the little schoolhouse in the prairie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and uh, and th that symbolized a type of schoolhouse. And um, it, this, this schoolhouse that was built in, in Switzerland for, for the initial uh, first chapter of the project uh, has a quote by, the famous quote by John Donne, no mine is an island entire of it itself. You know, we all are a piece of the continent and every, every person's death diminishes you. you know, and, Did everybody uh, catch that? No man is an island. No man is an island and tariff it itself. It's, it's, a, it's a famous quote that is used by Hemingway in For Whom the Bell Tolls, because the end of that quote says, so do not ask for whom the bell tolls, because it tolls for thee. Meaning that whenever anybody dies, it, you are diminished, because it's a part of humanity that's lost, because we all are connected as humanity. So we should be concerned with the passing of every single individual, and we should be concerned with the fate of every single individual because we are a whole. It's a collective, yes. Yeah, a collective. So to me, that was like a, a nice way to think about mm -hmm. that notion of togetherness, mm -hmm. you know, th that was initially invoked with the idea of Pan-Americanism. Um, and um, so I started a series of workshops, but so shortly after these workshops, that's when I realized that the only way that I could actually make this project happen in a meaningful way was to do it in the Americas itself. And, uh, and I did not want to go to the big capitals of the Americas. I did not want to go to use Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo and, and New York and such, or LA, but um, also go to the small towns, to, to the small places that also constitute the Americas. Mm -hmm. And that's what informed the entire project. <laughs> I mean, I could go on, yeah. but. Yeah, no, I think I'm just, um, illustrations are flashing behind us. Um, so I guess a, the title of the exhibition, which we put together collectively, it was a conference call, or three, or five, <laughs> and there was discussion about how to, how to kind of follow up the schoolhouse and the bus. We were here last uh, January, I think at the end of January, and we, we figured out it's, there's a bus, there's a schoolhouse, we'll figure that out. Um, and then we wanted to have some kind of a way of framing what that actually meant or spelling that out. So mobility, pedagogy, and engagement. Um, and I wanted to kind of tease out what, what those terms mean I, and what, I, yeah. I think before we do that, sure. I should probably, since you did explain sure. the project, I don't think I've explained anything about yeah, it. Do we sure. all? Yeah. Yeah. Has everybody seen the exhibition? Because we might not need to. Have you seen the exhibition? Who has seen the exhibition? Good, excellent. Okay. All right. Not everyone, all right. so it's worth well, explaining. Well, just briefly, um, I was invited to a small community called Barrio Antioquia, and it's in the middle of Medellin, and as I explained, Medellin was uh, beset by multiple forms of violences, including governmental and non-governmental and um, drug trafficking and so on. And the idea was to take the research of anthropologists, including Pilar Reano, and make it, um, put it into a work of public art. So um, the, the academics and the, the social actors that I was working with, the politicians and so on, we're thinking about how does a city become a city that learns? In other words, wh what can art add to this idea of a pedagogic space that a city occupies? And in this small barrio Antioquia, which was about, I think, 20,000 people, about 2,000 homes, um, it, was very, um, it, it was very stratified by forms of violence 
such that, you know, your son might have killed my father, and therefore, when we had the funeral for your son, my nephew was going to drive by and shoot at the funeral. So it's really a, a, a violent territory um, beset by many kinds of violences uh, beset by. But it, it also was a place where anthropologists were working on the idea that materiality of objects contain memories and that workshops where people shared objects that reminded them and shared memories could help reconstruct the fabric that had been broken down. So we knew that we were going to make a museum. It was going to involve objects taken from people's homes. And, but we couldn't put it in any given place because what would happen is that um, you couldn't, like you might not be able to go down the street where I lived. It was that territorialized, these, this two square miles. So what we did was we made a museum filled with objects from people's homes that moved from place to place to place. So that at any given day, some group of people in Barrio could go into this museum. And what they would see is these objects that were anonymous, but they collectively described a community's loss and helped people in the bus begin to reconstruct the memories, the places, and the people. It was actually not attacked at all during the two, two weeks that it was in the barrio, and then it went to Medellin proper down to the, the city, uh, central city area to represent people from this barrio to the larger um, uh, town of Medellin. So it was um, in the bus, when you went into the bus, you would write a letter to an unknown neighbor. And at the end of the project, those letters were delivered back to neighbors. So you might get an anonymous letter from an anonymous person. And the idea was deliberately not allowing people to reestablish the territorialities that existed. Like, oh, I got the letter from Pablo. I don't like Pablo, and therefore. Right. So I got an anonymous letter that may or may not have come from Pablo that wished for the future, you know, wished positive things for the future of the barrio. And the violence was through the 90s. I'm glad you stopped. You did describe the project, but more loosely before. And I think- Actually, I just described yeah. your question, which was, how do I get there? Yeah, how do you, so- <laughs> How do so I you, get there? You got there. Very I, literal. Yeah, but I think that, um, I'm curious how, how you engaged people in writing those letters and who was involved. And what were the objects? So, I mean, we can see some of them so here. So we put together a team of uh, young people, and they became a leadership team. We trained them in anthropological research, and they went from house to house to house. And they asked people, what object would you like to give me, and what memory does it contain? And they took notes. And um, that was the sort of anthropological platform for the project. The letters were written by whoever came to the bus. Uh, but what was interesting as one result of this project was that the young people, maybe there was about 15 or so of them, they became leaders and they're actually participating in the project today, several of them. So these were kids that when I first met them, they were 12 and now they're, um, however many years later, some of them have gone through college, some of them have children who themselves have been killed in the, so when you go into the museum, the, you'll see on one side the project from 1999, and then you'll see a project from 2000, um, 11. 2011, yeah. where we went back and talked to those people about the intervening changes in Medellin as it relates to violence. So they were children or youth, and they became adults. So you see that community that formed around that yeah. project. I'm going to change the script a little bit, because we could go through mobility, pedagogy, and engagement. But every answer to every question goes there anyway, I think. So yeah. um, I was being kind of literal. That happens sometimes. Um, am I going back? Yeah, forwards. I can say a word about mobility. Yeah, I, that would be great. Um, in 2002, I organized a symposium titled The Museum as Medium. And um, I had this idea that I wanted to do this, museum, this event in Mexico City and in New York mm -hmm. uh, and repeat the, the, the same format. 
because I felt that it would be interesting to have the same questions, but with different participants. And, and we did that. And uh, it was really surprising to me that the questions that, I mean, this, it was really a, a symposium about institutional critique, you know, uh, about artists who work in that field or worked in that area. And what was interesting to me was that the, the questions that, that, that emerged in, uh, in the US, in the New York portion, were really about the, the privatized system of the art world, you know, and about, uh, about individuals and about institutions. And whereas in Mexico, it was really about state uh, policies and about the government. Because, of mm -hmm. course, in Mexico, uh, or if you don't know this, but the, uh, the majority of, of culture, that the museum culture that's run in Mexico is funded by the government. And there is an art world of, of, of collecting and all that, but, uh, but the responsibility of running museums is generally seen uh, to fall onto the government. And it's not like the way that it happens here where you have like a board and, and it becomes a nonprofit organization and such. And so that, that, that experience showed me how like the same question can have vastly different answers wherever you go. Museum you know, as medium. The museum as medium. And, the, and then, so when I started uh, uh, the next year, starting thinking about the School of Pan American Unrest, I, I had the same, I, I felt that, you know, you should ask the same question to completely different places. You know, the, the, what really needs to change is not the question, but the, place. the, the people who, where, you, where this question gets yeah. asked. And indeed, you know, the, 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 the way that, that questions were addressed in places as different as Anchorage and Tegucigalpa, Honduras, was dramatic. Because, of course, people would reply uh, responding to the, the, the history of that particular place, uh, the, the legacy of, of, uh, of good and bad things that have happened in those locations. So in a way, it, it, the project became kind of like this, uh, movable mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. of, of questioning that was uh, filled and, uh, and then resignified, I guess, wherever it went, mm -hmm. you know. And so what are, what are the challenges that you faced doing these projects? Like, um, I mean, I can imagine, Suzanne, you were invited in, but there, it seems like the cultural fabric would be quite fragile in Medellin when you were there, or maybe it was maybe because of this organization that had already started to form? You know, it wasn't an organization. I want to be yeah. really clear what was amazing to right. me, because I was used to producing my own everything, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. uh, entrepreneurial um, organizing and fundraising and everything. We, I always operated outside of museums um, as, I mean, I operate in museums too, but basically my practice was developed in terms of social relations, political structures, and institutions, and so on. But what was amazing here was I was invited in, and in uh, I was invited in to a really sophisticated group of people who had been working since the early 90s on creating a civil society, and these guys were serious. They were literary theorists, and they were uh, economists, and, and that was amazing for me to work in that environment where I got to be the artist. I didn't have to be the everything PR person and you name it. I got to be the artist. So, so we worked collectively to figure out what best represented the problems that mm -hmm. they were experiencing. The obvious thing that I would encounter being there was I thought was being white, but it turns out that wasn't really the issue. That, I, that certainly was in a lot of the U.S. communities I'd worked in. Um, but it, the problem was being a gringa. And in that environment, that represented more than just a person uh, from uh, the U.S. And, and another country in Latin America. That represented Colombia, which is the, you know, the epicenter, in a sense, of American intervention. And if you don't know anything about the politics of the US and Colombia, it's really worth a read because it, it is indicative of the relationship between the US and probably every other country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Latin America. And it's pretty profound, the level of militaristic and governmental and economic engagement we have in that country. So when I showed up, you know, people are always very kind, I think. People on a personal level are kind um, and welcoming. But on a political level, I was very conscious of the fact that these are guys who, this, Barrio Antioquia is one of the centers of drug running 
in um, Pablo Escobar came from, you know, from not Barrio Antioquia, but from Medellin area. And Barrio Antioquia is a very poor but very historic place. A lot of the kids I worked with had been involved or their families had been involved in as, as mules going back and forth to the state. So I showed up as kind of a, iconically the person that represented a place they were very attracted to and had relationships with. But I also represented a government, not that I represent the government, but I represented a culture which has been, and a country which has been deeply damaging to the lives of people there. So for me, that negotiating that territory was a serious, um, and did you activity. did you go to live there for a period of time, or was it no? But when I work visits? in a place, yeah. I go a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm there. Like now, I'm working in England, and I'm there four to six times a year in the small community, and I'm there for one to two weeks at a time, and I establish relationships that mm -hmm. really go on for decades. That's got to be hard. I mean, and interesting, but to no, no, okay. No. <laughs> It'd be like commuting to a new place. Well, it is for every for each well, project, airplane, which, which feels yeah. Um, I like flying. Pablo, do you have any kind of challenging moments? I mean, there's um, there's one in the well, mobility um, section. Well, I would say yeah. I mean, this is, this lies at the core of what social practice is, you know, and it's really how you as artists uh, play your role uh, of outsider um, or acknowledge your role as somebody, as you were saying, you know, you are like the, the American that comes into, into Colombia without that baggage of what an American is in that particular context. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, the, the projects that we did, we, were, had to, we had to contend with that baggage of where we were coming from. Uh, and I, in, in my case, it just varied widely depending of where I went. Because uh, in a place, for example, like Guatemala, uh, being Mexican in Guatemala is a, com it's a complicated thing. You know, there's a, there's a lot of historic uh, um, tensions, and, uh, uh, and and especially being a Mexican artist coming into Guatemala was, was seen with great suspicion. Uh, similarly, in Buenos Aires, for example, in Argentina, people quest deeply questioned my project philosophically. They would not let me have a conversation with them because they wanted to talk about what I meant by conversation. They wanted they wanted to <laughs> me to explain what I meant by explaining. They wanted me artist. to explain what was like what was what you know. <laughs> The meaning of yes is, yeah. uh, and it, to the point that it was impossible to really make any progress. Uh, in some countries like El Salvador or uh, smaller countries in, in Central America for whom the notion of integration is really important, it really lies at the core of who they want to be. They, they see themselves not just as Salvadoran, they see themselves as Central American. Mm -hmm. uh, they cared a lot about these issues and they wanted to, to humor me by being part of a process that I was proposing. Um, I, I was proposing a very structured process of discussion and conversation that I was not willing to see any, um, let's say, changes to. And, and that was sometimes challenging. But at the same time, I always felt that in order for, for it to be a true engagement, it needed to happen that way. And uh, so it was a combination of dealing with the, the cultural, uh, historic backgrounds of every place that I was going to. Uh, and and the um, and, and truly trying to find a, a model uh, of conversation collaboration that will be meaningful and productive for that particular exchange. Um, but one of the most uh, wonderful experiences I had was when I arrived to Paraguay and uh, in Asuncion, um, a country that um, had a, a, a terrible. Um, uh, dictatorship, um, like my, my many places in South America, and uh, and it was uh, struggling at the time, still struggling today. Um, when I arrived, the the art world there told me like, we're so excited that you're here because I think you're the first artist that comes from outside in ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, meaning well, that artists from yeah. Argentina or Brazil or other places that had you know, that had the opportunity to, to go, they would rather go to Europe or the US mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. another place. No, nobody cared about going to that particular location. Mm -hmm. And that's when I felt that that is a place where we belong as artists, like to the, in those locations where um, there's no expectation of anything happening. You know, that, that, that those are the places where we are needed. And, uh, and it's very nice to feel needed. But also appreciation, right? And, and appreciation, yeah. yes, of course. You know? I mean, of course, you know, we, we have, of course, to insert ourselves in situations where 
where, where we feel it's urgent and it's necessary and we have to be, for example, part of the political process here in this country and, and such. You know, but at the same time, we, we have to pay attention to those communities that, that feel um, abandoned or that don't, don't feel included in a conversation. Um, I'm going to move on to the point of pedagogy. I wanted to change the script, but I still think it's important since both of you were so deeply engaged in pedagogy. And the first time I probably heard of an artist saying, my, my material is pedagogical, was Greg Bordowitz, um, an activist artist who is involved with the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York. And since that time, that was um, in 2002 or 2003, um, around the time that you were thinking about doing the School of Pan American Unrest, um, it became really clear that pedagogy is, can be a tool for art, it can also be an art form in itself. But I maybe want to hear from you about how you come to pedagogy as an art form and how you use it. Suzanne? Well, I, for me, I am a teacher, number one, and um, I've been deeply influenced by my teachers. And as a working class kid, it's been, it, you know, education was the way out of the mm -hmm. tiny little town in the San Joaquin Valley that I came from. And um, so I'm, I'm deeply committed to working class people and people of color being able to get free education always. And the more, the better. <laughs> And, and I actually came to this school, fortunately, at a time, I, I was in high school when California, um, this is very influential on my future, California in 1960 passed the Higher Education Act, and it created a system of junior colleges, state colleges, and universities, this is one of them, that gave every kid that graduated from high school in California the opportunity to go to whichever one of those uh, institutions they had the brains to go to, period, full stop. So I happily went to years and years and years of college uh, mm -hmm. and um, was ch it changed my life. It got me out of that town, but um, it got me into an understanding of global perspectives of the fact that, you know, me living in uh, Wasco, California, didn't know you know what about the world, that the world was comprised of, of incredible differences of experience, and that sort of, I learned through my work, and that's the most important aspect of my work, is that I learn, for me, personal, is that I learn through the generosity of the people I work with, who share with me their experiences. So um, the works, the preparation for a work becomes a kind of reciprocal learning environment that um, takes place over weeks, usually, usually over years, really. You know, a project can take me, I'm working on a project now in Bristol, which I've been working on for 10 years. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, and it's called the University of Local Knowledge, interestingly enough. It's about working class perspective on knowledge. And um, for me, knowledge is, and, and pedagogy within the work is both part of the process, but also part of the intention of the work. Because the work intends to educate in some public way. And it might be educating to our personal experiences, or, but, but of course from feminism you know the personal is political. So there's rarely a group of people who get together and share an experience within a cultural context where there's not something political about that experience. Mm -hmm. So both being curious about learning, experiencing the process of learning, and then incorporating that into a work style is how I approach the idea of pedagogy. How about you, Pablo? Um, one thing I want to say is, um, I, I think that, that, that the reason why you know uh, education is important for us, you know, uh, is, is because it, it's a uh, it's a method or a process through which we can accomplish specific goals. Uh, and in other words, like it, I don't I don't believe in education as an end in itself, uh, because I, fi I find it that that comes a little tricky. For example, when you say my teaching is my art. Um, that becomes like a really beautiful thing to say, but it also becomes a bit cliche. It seems like, oh, you know, you know, 
checking my iPhone is my art, you know, or, <laughs> or, or, you know, um, or, you know, taking a shower every morning is my art. I mean, it, it's... Well, Capra might have said that. <laughs> Capra would say, yeah, I'm sure uh, Capra would say that. But um, I was, I, I, I'm not interested in simply declaring any sort of activity that I do as an artwork. I think, I think what's really most important is to really use that language that you have learned uh, or employed of education and, and pedagogy and employ it towards different goals. And there's so many things we can do with it. Um, and the reason why I, I started employing it was because I was in a museum, I was teaching uh, in museums, and then I was seeing all these relational art uh, like prol proliferating everywhere. And I was feeling that the interactions that, that, these, that were being celebrated were so, uh, vacuous, you know, they, they were really about nothing. They were really about showing up in the gallery and like hanging out and touching a button or having a drink, you know, <laughs> and, and, and to me, it just, I, I really felt that, you know, that, that cannot be the goal of art today. We have much more urgent things right. to do and, and, and use education for. And, and education, uh, if, if any of you has worked in a museum, you, you know that the education department is the people's department, is, is the department that works with people from children to adults of all ages, people from all different, people with disabilities, people of color, uh, people of all social backgrounds, people with PhDs, and people who have never been in a museum in their life before. And it's a, a, a department that, that engages with human experience and whose mission is to really connect the art to individuals and show them that, this is, that art is important because it's art made by people like us, that have experiences like us. It shows the humanity in the art. And I, all those things are very important to, to, to include in a process of communication. Uh, so for me, uh, our, our artworks that are just simply, uh, let's say, a, an artist that says that they made a school, are not interesting, interesting to me in themselves. You know, because we're not here to do a re representation of education. We are here to actually do, uh, and then and what we do becomes becomes the uh, what, what hopefully becomes valuable. Um, so it, it I, I, I say this in, in the in the book about social practice that I wrote that um, the the difference between uh, more conventional forms of art making is that uh, for centuries we have dealt with a tradition of representation where artists are basically making an image of something that is reality, that represents reality. We're, we're talking about reality, and that's totally okay. But social practice, what tries to propose is, is to be that reality, to really not, not just stay in the realm of representation, it, it's, it's, it's in the realm of reaction. We're not pretending that we're doing like a campaign, we are doing the campaign. You know what I mean? It's, like it, it's, it's about uh, inserting yourself in the social process in order to affect it and change it. And if you do not change it, then that matters. So let me say something else about pedagogy that's um, as um, one of the things that I've been influenced by deeply is critical pedagogy. And I actually find it an interesting form of theory in contrast to um, certain kinds of Western European theory that's pretty much a given in, in uh, art as a, a form of analysis of art. I find it very interesting to think about people like Henry Giroux, Herb Cole, people who are thinking through what it means to explore situations of power in a reciprocal learning situation. And uh, if you think about it, you turn on the television at night and you look at CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, which I do all the time. I like to go back and forth because, <laughs> because that's a form of pedagogy that's operating you know, in homes across America. And, that, um, that pedagogy is, to me, best explained by critical, critical pedagogues, people who are exploring how teaching and learning construct power relationships in public space. Uh, so for me, that's been a very interesting way to look at art and the art that we do and what kind of ideas are being communicated about what kinds of, of the ways we ought to live our lives, the ways we can live our lives, what is possible. That's all stuff you're learning all the time from public culture. So how we as artists operate with respect to that critique that critical pedagogists, who tend to be um, academics and people who are th uh, theorists of education, how you think about that as applied to visual art and, and 
social practice is really interesting. To Can me. you just tease out one thing? You mentioned the idea of how power is constructed in public space or in the public realm. I think. Well, I we mean, all know that, don't we? Well, <laughs> it's being enacted daily. Yes. Uh, on television. This is maybe an example or, or uh, what, what strikes you right now. It's, there's so much. Okay. I, um, <laughs> uh, this morning on television, um, the stuff that's going on around General Kelly mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that there's, you, you all know about General Kelly, and the, the guy that's Trump's chief of staff, right? And that he is uh, in the process of a discourse nationally where uh, around race, do you know that? You ought to look, mm -hmm. you ought to check it out. Uh, so, so what's going on, what went on this morning, or I guess yesterday morning was Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the, um, the uh, secretary. press secretary, yeah. Trump's press sec secretary was saying, well, you wanna fight with a general? You wanna tell a general he didn't tell the truth? Well, that's an exercise of power right. that takes place between the viewer and uh, uh, the, the positionality of Kelly and his right. relationship to the military. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't question a general. What is the, you know, he's there because he's a general. So that's what So I from think a critical about. pedagogy perspective, it would be that you, you do. What I just the did general. was analyze it yeah. from yeah. A pedagogy. Okay. What are we learning? Right. And, and it's critical. Cool. <laughs> um, so then I think you were both kind of touching on like, if there isn't change, if there's not a shift produced by this pedagogical, I'm gonna use the word engagement, then, then in a way you haven't accomplished what you've set out to accomplish. So I'm gonna ask two questions, like how do you measure success with engagement? And maybe like what is the engagement piece in your projects that you've, you have on And I view? just wanna to add to you yeah. because you just said um, if you don't, uh, what, what, what did you say, if you don't intervene, if nothing happens, it's, well, I, I, was, I was talking about how, you know, what we try to do is not simply represent mm -hmm. or show Aesthetics images. We're, we're trying to act on reality. So if you don't act or if something doesn't happen, is that what you were... So, so that, that we, we have... success? That, that are, or we, we depend on, on that action. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about, about what exactly constitutes success. I mean, yeah. I, I had this question when I did the, the Pan American project. What if I don't make it all the way to the end of the, of the world? You know, <laughs> what if I, which I did, you know, yeah. I, I did make it barely, but I <laughs> somehow made it. Um, and, um, and I wondered, you know, what, what is it, what, what really constitutes the, the success of, the, of, 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 this, of this project? Um, and, um, yeah, but we, we also ask ourselves th that for other fields. You know, we ask ourselves about activism. You know, was, was a particular movement ex effective? You know, was Occupy Wall Street like successful or not? Mm -hmm. These are very difficult uh, questions to answer. And in education, it's also difficult, you know, because you, you don't know what was the effect of something you learned until sometimes 20 years later. Right. You know, many times you, you have, a, you see an artwork, let's say, uh, uh, many years before, and then it comes back to you, and then suddenly you realize, you, you, you come to realizations, not automatically. And, and I think uh, we contend with that, the problem that, that these uh, insights, these realizations are not immediate, they're not automatic. You know, and, uh, and I absolutely believe that you have to measure and you have to evaluate what you do, and we have to keep ourselves honest, and, uh, and uh, we have to have mechanisms through which you know what we do is mm -hmm. this is, is is critiqued and uh, and and put to the test. But at the same time, putting like a, these impossible boundaries or or parameters can be detrimental. Well, you ha you gave um, a kind of structure to one part of the engagement in the School of Pan American Unrest, which was um, the declarations or the addresses. They have different names, but in each each location or most of the locations, you came up with an address. Right, and I have some images up of that. If, if yeah, and we, in fact, we're actually going to do that to, tomorrow here in, in the, in the, for this exhibition. Uh, so that was a very basic uh, component of the uh, of the of the project that emerged organically, uh, <laughs> because or initially I was I just wanted to have these discussions, but then I felt that the discussions needed to lead somewhere, that we needed to have like a, an actionable item that would emerge from these conversations. And then uh, that's how in the first uh, gathering that we had, which was in Vancouver, um, uh, 
actually, you know, the, the first one was in Anchorage, and we did not have that in Anchorage, but in Vancouver, we um, discussed this idea of putting everything we had discussed into some kind of manifesto. And that, that was the first Pan American address. The idea that the things that we had discussed that were the concerns of, of the city, the concerns of the, the, the cultural uh, community in that particular city could be expressed in an affirmative uh, or in a proactive manner through this declaration. It made it official, it made it very um, uh, open and public, and it also made us all invested into coming with a deliverable. Mm -hmm. You know, meaning like it was not simply about having a conversation. It was about you guys represent the city today. You guys are the representatives. What is your message to the rest of the world about the thing, the issues that are faced by your city? So it was, in a way, it became kind of like a a, a very symbolic and, and simple act of civil engagement that, nonetheless, people took very seriously. Generally, people would be like, "Well, I'm not speaking only for myself. I'm speaking for my entire community when I say these words." And it was also nice to, to uh, be able to do that uh, with people who were only accustomed to speaking about their own experience. That they, it, was, it was forcing them to think about the experience of people around them as well. Right. And, in, and in that sense, I mean, I think that, the, the, I mean, it, it didn't always work, you know, because it, I, I depended on the, on the goodwill and the, and the openness of the communities I was working with. And many times it didn't work at all. What wouldn't work? Well, like for example, in Buenos Aires, you know, it was difficult to convince them to, to work with me because they, they wanted to me to define work. <laughs> <laughs> Still, yeah. and, and things like that. So, I mean, yeah. it, it, uh, or, or, you know, in Chicago, nobody showed up and I was by myself, you know, in this uh, Did you do you know, an workshop. address? Did you, did you come up with I, 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 I read an address, but uh, not a single person showed up to the workshop and I was by myself completely. I mean, it, it, these things that you can never anticipate. Control, and then yeah. other times, you know, in, in, in other cities, it was like a massive amount of people that were there that wanted to write the address. Right. It was really difficult to, to gauge the, the... And are you in touch with any of the people who wrote the addresses? Like, have any of the addresses materialized in a kind of, even a very small cultural change? Yes, we, we, we yeah. For yeah. example, in, in Merida and Yucatan, there was like something I've mentioned uh, before. Um, the young artists were, we, we did the project in an art school in, in Merida. Uh, and um, and the, the artists were really excited. The young artists, the students, were super excited about the project and they really wanted to write the address and all that. And then we had these more established, uh, I guess, uh, older artists in, the, in, the, in Merida who were making very traditional art. They were making more like folk art. And, and, and they, these students were making conceptual art and they, they were horrified. <laughs> you know, they felt that they were making like this very New York type of art making. And so we had this uh, unbelievable discussion between the, the folk artists and, and the younger artists who were making, trying to be Matthew Barney, you know, in Merida. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we had really wonderful discussions about, about art, you know, and about what is the function of art and who is it for. Because these guys were making art for tourists, essentially. You know, they were making art for the tourist industry, whereas these other artists were, the younger artists were making art for this, like, maybe vague art world that was not really there. Right. You know, they, they were making uh, images inspired in art forum. Mm -hmm. um, so as a, as a result, we, um, the, the agreement was that there would be a week of, uh, or a month of criticism uh, where people would actually uh, review one another's shows and have discussions about art. And uh, this, this might be a very small achievement in the, in the, lar in the larger scope of things, but it was a, a realization that a community realized that they needed that kind of conversation. Right. And that they had never really sat at a table and spoke, just spoken to one another. And this simple act of sitting together and, and confronting one another's ideas was very revealing for either, for both sides because it didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. So if if, uh, if the project achieved any small things like that, I, 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 would, I would always yeah, be. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think even that moment of realization is major because if not for you prompting that conversation, it may not have happened. Yeah. Or those groups I mean, might and, not have and, come and, together and, yet. And you know, going back to education too, I mean like when, when you, as, as a, when you're a professor or, or, uh, or instructor, um, you always ask yourself, you know, if what you teach uh, really has any, had any impact. And uh, it, it will be rare t 
to expect that like all you know, the hundreds of thousands of students you've had can have been deeply transformed. But if only a small group has actually had um, like a like a deep uh, ha have, has absorbed a sort of message from what you have done and you have done something with it, you know, then then I think you can consider yourself successful. Suzanne, do you with skin of memory, are there certain outcomes that you were able to measure that were states? I have a really conflicted um, relationship to this question. Good. Um, on the one hand, yes, if you want to know what happened, you can look at, in this case, I'm fortunate enough to have my anthropologist friend did a study on this. And so she can give you a social scientist qualitative analysis right. of it. But I was also trained here as a scientist. And so, you know, this notion of proof, I've looked at it a lot. Uh, and I do think that when we enter social practice, we put ourselves into a kind of a difficult position because people expect, like they do a protest, like they do Occupy, they expect the change. And as you point out rightly, transformation in, in individuals and complexly in cultures and in laws and, you know, all of these things are, are uh, really hard to gauge. And the problem that it puts us in is we're artists and we come from a profession that I have to say a visual art process is somewhat narcissistic. Pardon me for all of us in the room that are visual artists, but the, the problem is that we like to claim results. So we put ourselves in a position, I figured this out years ago and started writing articles on how do you know what you say you're doing, you're doing. <laughs> and you what know, as an artist, the fallback position, to be perfectly blunt, is anecdote. And um, I'm, as the part of me trained as a scientist, is pretty suspicious of anecdote, particularly when relayed by the person who is claiming the credit for the, for the change. So when people ask me if I <laughs> cause change with my work, I'm always kind of like, uh, can we talk, ask another question? Or, you know, I tend to divert it. Or ask somebody else. Ask somebody who participated. Yeah, there. but or then I can, I can, you know, you know this. All of us who are in social practice, we know how to choose the community leader. Would you please get up and tell everybody here how your life was changed by the artwork? That, um, and, and I don't think change even operates that way. I mean, mm -hmm. I think change in political form, which is what we're ultimately after, yes. and in experience happens, you know, really differently. And nobody's demonstrated that I know of that change in experience causes change in polit policy. Right. That's a really interesting thing to explore. So. Yes, look at, look at the anthropologist I'm working with, and she'll tell you what happened as a result of this. And she's written papers on it, she's presented them, she's talked about the way it shifted people's uh, experience in quantifiable ways. But I do think it's really interesting to think about this question, mm -hmm. for all of us to consider how do we know we're doing what we say we're doing. One of the ways that um, you can do it is you can measure it scientifically. I tried in New Orleans measuring the number of times the equal rights amendment phrase entered the news media during the time I was there, because that was one of the things I was trying to do. Was, so we counted X number of times it showed up, and, I, and then at the end of it I said, you know, and I don't know that that's what art does. Right. And we put ourselves in that position when we were, I think in the, I think in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, there was this move to, to break out of the studio and into public sector. And we all said, oh yeah, way, we're gonna, we're gonna be out there in the world, we're gonna end violence against women. And then we put ourselves in a situation of not knowing uh, how to measure that. And of course it was impossible, we weren't gonna be able to stop violence against women globally. So, so I think we really need to think more and more deeply about what is it that art does and how is it measured. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does take place in individual experience and anecdote reveals that. It also takes place in policy and people like Richard, for example, Richard Ross over there is working on these kinds of issues in serious and political ways. So I think that, that we have to be careful what we say, but also careful what kind of what kind of issues, what kind of expectations we lay on art. Mm -hmm. 
right. you know, which after all is ephemeral and often yeah. doesn't and, have and, any and, money and attached and to it. And actually that, that, you know, unfortunately for social practice, I think we, put, we position ourselves in a really difficult place because on the one hand, we are, we exist still in the art world, yeah. uh, which demands uh, aesthetic, an aesthetic experience of a certain sort, you know, and this is the, the, the struggle you and I have putting this exhibition together, mm -hmm. because... Um, but you have less struggle than do you, I do, I'd like to point out. <laughs> Your visual but, capacity is great. No, but, no, but you know, it, it, it's this problem that how do you really make something look um, sensorially interesting yeah. or yeah. engaging for a particular... How do, you, how do you really conform to those traditional demands of, of the... Of, uh, of art making, wanting to make something uh, interesting or engaging or beautiful or whatever. And on the other hand, it's, it's the, the demand on change, the demand of like deliverables, the demand that, oh, well then if you, if you got into that, if that community, show me the results, show me what you did. You know, and um, so we are always constantly trying to balance the, what is really like the, the visually appealing or interesting project with, with the social relevance of the project. And uh, I, I think we're still trying to figure out how, how we can um, um, balance those, those demands. I heard somebody saying recently, you can't measure epiphany. How do you measure an epiphany in relation to art? Um, I want to open it up to questions. But before, can yeah. I just say one quick thing? Social change doesn't happen by a person, and right. it doesn't happen by an art project. It happens by collective activity yeah. of many, many people working in many, sort of to push the ball up the hill in the same direction. And I think that's what becomes really problematic for us is you, you align with lots of organizations and people, and I align with lots of organizations and people. And, you know, we never do anything in isolation from those people. So I think. I think that's why it's really difficult to ascribe social right. effects from right. an artwork. Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah, okay. That's, true. that's a good point, and it's a good way to close this part of the conversation. Are there questions for Pablo and There's Suzanne? Yeah. We have one over here. Do we need to bring a microphone over? No. Okay. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, there's a microphone. I'll bring a microphone. Here. Here. Is this on? Back. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Robert. Okay, um, so my question has to do with institutions. Pablo, uh, you're at the MoMA right now, correct? Mm -hmm. And Suzanne, you're at Risky now? No, USC. Risky School, UCS. Rosky. Rosky, Rosky. Rosky sorry. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's a risk. Yeah. <laughs> it's a risky. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, no longer risky. So you both have places Solid. in the institutions, and how do you think about community from those positions, and is it always about sort of modifying what those institutions already do and trying to funnel the resources? And, for example, like, is the museum still a place to believe in? Sometimes I find that hard to like entertain, and I and I say that critically because you know I'm an artist, and it's like I always want to be there. Like, if my work isn't there, I don't feel valuable. And especially when I think about like prestige in the art world and how that's really important. Um, so again, I, I'm I'm asking uh, like institutions and community, like how are they really supposed to? relate to one another and like do you break down an institution like deconstruct it modify it edit it and help it better serve the communities that it's supposed to serve thank well, you okay i don't know if you want to ask uh, no, answer I can, I can say something about this um i believe uh museums are here to stay um i mean i think i i, I guess i'm i understand the idea of like let's destroy all museums and all institutions but then what do we have left you know, um, I think there is a function for 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 art to be preserved and historic art for it to be preserved, and and I do think it's important to protect that. At the same time, you know, I've, I've, I mean, I've been an artist my entire career, but while working also in a museum, and I've always had, to be honest, this Clark Kent Superman conflict. You know, <laughs> where <laughs> like where okay. where where does that line get yeah. divided? Um, but one thing, so a few things that I've learned about this divide is that um, I do. 
uh, I am grateful to, to be able to work in an environment where it's not about myself, uh, where I have to work with others, where I, I have to work toward changing ideas. And I think it's not very different from working for the government. You know, it's, it's like being critical of the government. Well, if you want to change the government, why don't you become, why don't you join government and like work to, you know, run for, for office and, and try to, to make changes yourself? Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't see it very differently than in, in, from, from the relation of the museum. And I've tried to do things within um, programming that has tried to, uh, to open up um, things that, that are uh, structures that, that, that go beyond what I see as very traditional forms of pedagogy. For example, I, I'm not fond of, uh, of inviting um, individuals to simply give lectures and speaking, at, t talking at people. I'm interested in dialogue. I'm not interested in, in the lecture format as this academic model. Uh, and I think that we can change those models, but only if we are from within the places that, that, that make those changes. And I also would add that um, I do feel that, uh, th that in the end institutions are individuals you know, or are conformed by different sets of individuals. And there's a, there's a very easy process of depersonalizing the institution by simply speaking about it in a, in a very kind of vague and abstract way, which is not very helpful for anybody. In the end, you know, we, we have, to, if we want to keep institutions uh, and organizations accountable for their actions, and the same goes to, to government, you cannot just say, well, the US government. You have to say, like, this particular person that is doing this particular act has to be held accountable for those actions. And it is my hope that we continue to to pay attention to the to the human component of of who, who of all those who are in museums, so that we have a very clear and direct dialogue, and, and also more hopes for for direct influencing on, on what might happen there. Well, I've explained my uh, interest in education, and um, so therefore, working within education, if I have to work, is not a bad place to work. <laughs> Um, as an artist, of course, I'd rather only make art all the time, every single minute of every day. Uh, but I um, have been fortunate enough to help invent a university, Cal State Monterey Bay. I've been fortunate to be, well, maybe not fortunate is the right word, to be a dean <laughs> of an institution, uh, but to change curriculum in education. And I've been fortunate to lead the Center for Art and Public Life and invent it. So I think the ability to operate creatively within institutions and to manifest your values is, is pretty available uh, to all of us. And it, the, the good thing that it teaches is how systems operate. Um, so if you ever want to know anything about how an academic system operates, for all my artist buddies, they call me up and say, hey, this just happened, what does this mean? And it's not knowledge I prize, but it is knowledge I have. So I think that for artists to operate within these institutions allows you to change the institutions and also allows you to understand systems, mm -hmm. how systems operate. Yeah, that's true. Are there other questions? You're either freezing to death <laughs> or bored to death. <laughs> yeah, we can bring you a microphone if you will hold on one second. Elise, there's someone over here. I wanted to ask a question about audience. Oh. Audience is something that, that you both talk about. And um, here we are in an audience. And while we believe in dialogue, it's very difficult to foster sometimes when you, we constantly have traditional forms like this sort of setup in our schools and but even in galleries or in situations where you're trying to you know exhibits where you're trying to have part participation by the audience so i wondered if each of you could speak about how you think about um deconst or, or empowering audience Well, come to the workshop tomorrow. <laughs> um, I mean, I, what, I, what I would say is um, we, we, we have limitations to what we can do. I mean, like we, um, the, the, the best approach I think we can have, and I think it's something that we have tried to do 
in this particular case is to create different models of interaction uh, that might uh, bring uh, different things to the table. Uh, ideally, um, uh, I mean, an ideal interaction uh, will be really being together in, in a small group and having a conversation. But the, the moment the group becomes bigger, it's very difficult to actually have a comprehensive well, you know, dialogue. I, 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 I think we're being polite and we are respecting the format that's been created for us mm -hmm. because both of us work. I, I would work very differently with this size of an audience and I bet you I could get some exchange going on but it would be a very different kind of conversation. It might be a different spatial arrangement. Mm -hmm. It might be a different topic. So I, I, I think that's a, a fair question, but probably not in this environment. Um, I think if you, if you look at either of our work, if you look at a lot of social practice, you'll see that people usually have quite a facility. I've done things like put people facing like an audience, like if you turn this row to face this row, and put the speakers in the middle where they popped up and put 30 speakers instead of one speaker uh, or three speakers. So there's ways you can interrupt that format. Another really good way to interrupt it is don't answer questions. So if we <laughs> set up here and right. you said, hey, Suzanne, what do you think about X? And I said, gee, what do you think about X? And we agreed, we would, which I've done on panels before, agreed don't answer the question. I mean, you have to tell people that's what you're after, but then you just, if we didn't answer the question, you guys would start talking. <laughs> you know, so there's ways to interrupt it. Right. I also think there's, it's important to acknowledge that to get these two together for this, in the, in the same space at the same time, like Pablo said, I'm in agreement that a smaller scale is preferable in terms of interaction and engagement, but you know, this is a great opportunity to hear from two people with a great deal of wisdom about art and politics and social social engagement. So here we are. There was a question over here, and we if we can bring the microphone to this woman in like the fourth row. Yeah. Um, my question is for Suzanne. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to your UCSB experience in education and how would it, how that influenced your later work, if it did, and what it's like being back on campus right now. Huh. Well, I think this is a very, um, I love this place. And I was here for what, three years. I went to junior college for two years, and then I was here for three years. But it was a really different time and a really different experience. Remember, I'm the year just before they burned the bank down. And um, we used to hang out in Isla Vista at like three in the morning and, and talk politics and look at Bob Dylan and um, <laughs> movies. Um, and um, it, you know, Isla Vista was Sin City then. I don't know what it is now, but, uh, <laughs> and you know, but those, those fraternity guys were always busy jumping off balconies into swimming pools and things. So it was a different moment and I was also in science so we're, we're the people that used to roam around in the middle of the night in all the labs, breaking into labs and hanging out on top of things. So I'm sure it's quite different, but that was sort of my experience. We have a question here, Elise. Thank you. Has there ever been a work of, uh, you done that you have any uh, felt kind of regret? Like you didn't know it would have affected much of a, made a big difference, but this curious, sorry. Did we raise? Regret. Do you have question. any regret about oh, a, a past project that maybe? Oh my God. <laughs> question. I, I, you know, I have these, um, I don't know how you feel, Susanna, about the things, that, but many, m most of the things that I do, once I'm concluding, concluded them, I don't want to see them again. I have these, uh, <laughs> this uh, kind of, uh, uh, impulse of like really closing that chapter and, and moving on. And the, each project of has good things, has bad things. Um, the one project that I have never been able to close the door to has been this one, hmm. you know, the School of Pan American Unrest, because it, it, it always has um, felt unresolved or completely open. Hmm. And, and it has been really difficult for me to find like a way to, to feel it resolved. Even now that we have it in an exhibition, I still feel it's, it's unresolved. And I, perhaps I just have to live forever with that feeling that it will never completely be, be resolved. 
but, uh, but I think that um, every project that we, that we do, we learn from it, and we make mistakes, and uh, we, it's, it's not so much regret, but it's, it's really like lessons that you learn from, from not having done it in a particular way, or, or not having been effective enough that you employ in the next thing that you do. But, uh, well, I'll hmm? be a lot more blunt. I wanted to shoot myself after a couple of performances. <laughs> <laughs> because I do performances, they're really high pressure. And because they involve sometimes hundreds of people, and they might take place on television or something where the timing is really exact, or I might be being protested by free Mumia people, which completely screws mm -hmm. with the first act of a performance. So I would say that my... Um, regrets are when it doesn't work the way I imagined it. And that's something you have to learn as an artist, that you imagine it and you go for the imagination. And then when it's something different, like that takes place in life, it can be really painful. It can be really painful. There's a question back here. There are two, actually. Um, as, the, as the microphones are being delivered. It's I the Otis crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, quick question. My name is Kate Twist, founder of Post Commodity and associate professor at Otis College. Um, I've stepped into some of the slippers that uh, Suzanne used to wear on campus. I like that slippers. And uh, very proud to. <laughs> boots, Kate, boots. <laughs> very proud to be taking those boots forward um, behind her. Um, one question that I have for both of you, there's something very fascinating that I thought got mentioned, and it's this idea of we're acting out a desired reality, this, this concept. Um, we're not imitating something. We're engaging and creating and making this reality. Um, reality has, a beginning, has no beginning and end. Projects do. And one of the most uh, commonly asked question is, um, how do you get started into a community? I know artists like us, we are invited. We have clout. We have all of these resources behind us. We have experience of working in the field with no budget if we have to. But what about for the students out there that are just trying to wrap their heads around this and they just can't quite figure out how do I get into the community to get started? And then this point B would be, at what point do you sense resolution? You know, at po what point do you think the project may be done? Thank you. You wrote the book on it, didn't you? <laughs> um, um, I, I feel that, um, Many times, when, when I've taught social practice um, to students, um, I, I, I often ask them to start thinking of, of uh, people they would like to work with or communities they're interested in. Um, but, but I do feel that it can become an obsession of who's going to be my victim, you know? Like who are going to like impose this experience on, onto others. Um, and and it, it, um, I think, I think the, the, the communities or the people that you work with emerge organically from a process of research uh, of your own particular interests, you know? And um, it, it becomes much harder when you basically say, well, I'm going to move into this town and I'm gonna change the town, I'm gonna like, work with these people. Um, I think it happens to us when many, many times we get invited by curators or museums saying, like, well, are you interested in doing a project in this particular place? And you know, we, you go to the place and it doesn't say anything to you or you don't connect, there's no chemistry, it's like dating. Suddenly you realize, well, there's, there's nothing I can really do here that will be meaningful or interesting. And that has happened to me many, many times. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, I think that, the, again, if you, if you operate from very uh, personal and, and, and uh, concerns that, that you're passionate about, projects can be very, um, they can grow, and, uh, and 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 you can find the people that that will that will become your your uh, your audience or your community. I think. And as to the question of how do you know when a project is over, um, I think it applies to art in general. You know, it, I think it's the same thing that you can ask to a painter. Like, when do you know that you're done painting or you're done with uh, with this uh, photograph? Or 
what, what is where is the moment where you feel that it's over? It, it's very difficult to ascertain that that you can finally close the door to it, and uh, and I think it changes for every at least for me for every experience. I don't know what you think. I think one of the things, and by the way, you guys should look up post commodity. Brilliant, brilliant work. Um, yes. And we're really lucky to have Kate, who's my Bakersfield compadre, uh, <laughs> uh, here with us, uh, and in California, Southern California teaching. Um, so I had experience in community organizing, literally training in community organizing, and so I always refer students to that, which I know you pulled on for your book as well, but those technologies, you might call them technologies, those techniques of learning how to work, to talk, to listen, are, um, there's a lot of it out there, so you can find that. Um, I started before museums invited you <laughs> to do this kind of work. Uh, there wasn't a museum in the world that would touch the kind of work we were doing in the 70s and 80s, and I think that's something that developed later. Um, and I actually find it more difficult to work with museums now, uh, based on having produced, raised my own money, produced my own projects, developed my own staff, and so on. Um, and museums can be kind of limiting in, in that uh, process. But I think you learn, I think the difficulty with finishing, it is right, it is an aesthetic uh, to finish a project, but it's also a, a personal set of relationships. And I think you can decide the projects over and the relationships go on. Um, and that's certainly been true for me for, for many, many years now. Um, but I think this project with Pilar is a good example of how things get reborn because we started in 99 and then Bill Kelly Jr. asked us back in 2011 to the Medellin Biennial and I said, I don't want to just talk about what we did, I want to do a new project. So we got back together with this community of 75 people, it was phenomenal to see all those people again and, and we reconstructed a new work and then when we came here to yep. this project, Pilar and I started thinking, yeah, but you know, maybe we ought to do something a little different and do a new project. So projects also are creative engagements that people spark with each other. Like Pablo and I worked with Otis students to do a great uh, intervention at the College Art Association. So it doesn't take too long for us to be sitting around with each other, continuing our relationship, where a new creative product comes out of it. So I think there's a kind of an interaction between relationship completion, if there ever was such a thing, till you die, and aesthetic completion, which maybe stops and then starts again, and then again, and so on. Was there one more question in the back? Yes. Um, what are some challenges that come up when teaching social practice in a formal setting? Hmm. Oh, you little brat. <laughs> That's I know why know. she asked that. <laughs> She's been trying to get that out of me for a year now. Well, this is the place. This is the time. Well, I, I, I would say um, <laughs> when I when I started teaching uh, social practice in um, at, at Portland State University, or I taught a class there, um, I realized that a lot of the students that that were coming to um, to the class did not really have an art background. That can be good and, 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 and negative in, in, in different ways, in the, in the sense that because they did not have an art background, uh, they were completely open to any sort of experiences. At the same time, the, the, the fact that they did not know our history was problematic because they, I, I, I felt that they really needed to have just a general understanding of what conceptual art was, about what, what, how performance works, and many times the things that they were doing, they were, um, imitating or, or, um, or being very derivative on ideas that were very, very established from years before. And at the same time, um, what I discovered was that, uh, in a way, the traditional training that at least I, I feel like I, I had, I mean, I, I learned printmaking and, and uh, oil painting and, and all these other things that you do generally learn in art school, um, those, those make you develop a certain uh, ability to uh, to become sensitized to, to how people experience uh, sensorially. And, um, 
and even if you are not going to do that as part of, of, of your uh, of, of social practice, I think it's important to know how it operates because we are creating experiences for people and, and this, this way of constructing experience is generally multisensorial. And um, so I do feel that those, the traditional training can be helpful in, in many ways. So, so I, I think that uh, when somebody come, comes to study social practice, um, um, they should not completely reject any other art forms. And we are, we're still part of the same dialogue of, of art making, you know, and, uh, and I think it's important to retain that. I know that um, in, at Portland State University, that's, there's the social practice MFA program, and I've been there a number of times. And the students grapple with the idea of working in another field, and you know, what are the ethics of taking on social work or mm -hmm. taking on mm -hmm. ethnographic work without having a kind of um, foundation for that kind of work because you're dealing with people. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of risk in, embedded in that. Mm -hmm. Did you? I'm gonna put th at least three of my gang from USC on the spot and ask you to just quickly say in one sentence what you need to know and learn in order to make social or, or socially engaged art. Up, up, Marton, <laughs> Noe. Media literacy. Media literacy. Oh, okay. that's, that's good. That's, that's great. Good. Noe? Listen. <laughs> Great. Anybody else? Who else is over there? Social practice. That's the social practice game. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, <laughs> see I what think, I mean? This is how you shift yeah. dynamics. I think we're going we're gonna to close here. Um, I want to thank both of the artists, Pablo and Suzanne, for being so open with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.